Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Sneha Palil, a technical support scientist here at ACD. Before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. First, the audience will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have a question, please use the chat function to the right of the WebEx window. My colleagues will address your questions in real time. In the event we have not addressed your question, we will follow up with you offline after the webinar. Second, the webinar is being recorded, so in the event you cannot stay for the whole duration of the webinar, we will have the recording up on our website. With that said, I would like to begin with our webinar. Here is a quick overview of the topics I'll be covering today. I'll begin with an overview of our RNA scope technology, followed by the general workflow and troubleshooting guidelines. I will go on to discuss base scope assays, applications of our technology, and finish with FAQs. What is RNA scope? The RNA scope assay is an in situ hybridization technique that utilizes a unique double Z target probe design, followed by a signal amplification system, which allows you to visualize a single mRNA transcript as a punctate dot through either chromogenic or fluorescent detection. This highly specialized system provides for simultaneous signal amplification and background suppression. Today, we currently have over 1,400 plus peer-reviewed publications using the RNA scope and base scope technologies. This shows the increase in market adoption of the RNA scope and base scope assays utilized in many different research and application areas. Here is a brief overview of the RNA scope workflow. RNA scope assay is a slide based assay and is intended for use on sample types similar to that used with ISC or IF. The assay starts with permeabilizing the sample with reagents provided in the pretreatment kit. The pretreatment allows unmasking of the target mRNAs, thus allowing the target probe to penetrate into the cell and hybridize the target RNA sequence. The target probe is a pool of oligos that are designed using our established bioinformatics algorithm, which allows for target specificity. A series of amplification cascades can then amplify the signal, and RNA molecules can be visualized under the microscope as punctate dots. The signal can also be quantified semi-quantitatively or quantitatively using image analysis software. The primary feature of our RNA scope technology is the probe design. Depicted here are the oligonucleotide target specific probes as ZZs. They have two unique regions linked by a spacer. Additionally, each one of these oligonucleotide sequences has been designed using an informatics algorithm which selects sequences that specifically bind to the target sequence of interest and not cost hybridized with any other sequences. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript. For amplification to occur, two Zs must hybridize to the target sequence right next to each other. Once this happens, this creates a 50 base target specific binding site on the bottom of the ZZ pair. On the other hand, the top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. Where the two Zs hybridize, it creates a binding site upon which a pre-amplifier can bind and the amplification tree can be built. A standard RNA scope probe for a target sequence of 1,000 base pairs or more consists of about 20 ZZ pairs pooled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region. As this allows for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, only a few ZZ pairs are necessary to bind to the target RNA sequence to generate enough signal for molecular detection. So, 
Here is a schematic showing the hybridization and the subsequent amplification of the RNA scope assay. The double ZZ probe will bind to the target mRNA transcript. Once the double ZZ probe binds, it serves as a foundation and binding site for the ample pre-amplifier molecule. And once the pre-amplifier is bound, it serves as a binding site for the amplifier molecule. And each amplifier can further bind multiple label probes, sequentially hybridizing to assemble a branching complex at each ZZ binding site. Label probes can contain a chromogenic enzyme, such as horse radish peroxidase, or HRP, that generates a visible signal after chromogenic reaction, such as with DAB, detectable under a standard bright field microscope. The label probes can also contain fluorophores that allow for visualization of the signal under a fluorescent microscope. This signal amplification strategy provides for visualization of target RNA as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule. If a single Z binds to the target mRNA transcript, as seen on the right, the preamplifier cannot bind as it needs both ZZs to provide a binding site. This, help, this helps to ensure the specificity of the probes and helps reduce potential background staining. In order to detect multiple mRNAs simultaneously, multiple amplification trees must be built. With that in mind, we must ensure specificity. The specificity is ensured by adding a unique tail sequence to the probes, meaning to the double Z probe design, we have a tail sequence that is indicative of a channel designator. For example, a C1 probe has a specific C1 tail sequence that will only allow for binding of the subsequent C1 preamplifier, amplifier, and label probe molecules. Likewise, a C2 probe will have a separate and unique tail sequence. This slide presents all the assays that are currently available from ACD. For example, if you have a single ish target, you may choose a single plex assay such as the chromogenic brown or chromogenic red assay. If you have two targets, you may choose the chromogenic duplex assay. However, if you're interested in multiplexing up to three or more targets, please opt for our fluorescent assay. On the other hand, if the target of interest is a short sequence or circular RNA, we recommend the base scope assay. I will be giving a detailed overview on the base scope assay in the later slide. As noted in the previous table, some of these assays are available on either the Leica Bond RX or the antenna discovery automated systems. If you are interested in this approach, please contact your local accounts manager. We additionally, we will have our local field application sciences available for training and troubleshooting. In the next few slides, I will discuss the RNA scope amplification and detection systems for the different manual assays. The diagrams here depict the single plex amplification system that includes the amplification tree, which is then tethered by an enzyme. To the left is the depiction of the red assay, which utilizes alkaline phosphatase and can then be visualized by a fast red chromogen. Likewise, for the brown assay presented to the right, utilizes HRP and is visualized by DAB chromogen. Brief overview of the duplex amplification is presented here. Both probe channels have independent amplification trees. The channel 2 associated amplification tree utilizes alkaline phosphatase enzyme and fast red substrate for the visualization of the marker. A separate amplification tree is built for the C1 channel, which utilizes HRP enzyme and green substrate to visualize the second marker. Please note that our C1 probes by default are ready to use and 1x in concentration, while the C2 probes are provided as 
50x stocks. In order to make a duplex probe mixture, combine the C2 probe with C1 probe in 1 is to 50 dilution. And in the event you would want to run the C2 probes alone, please use the RNA probe, probe diluent and combine at a 1 is to 50 dilution. The Mosaplex fluorescent assay utilizes the same amplification system and is similar to the duplex chromogenic assay. Here, three independent amplification trees are built, such as that the C1, C2, and C3 probes will have their own amplification trees stemming from where the probe has bound to the mRNA transcript. The signal can then be visualized from the tree from the three independent fluorescent label probes. Again, as mentioned before, if you're interested in using just the C2 or C3 probes by themselves, you'll be using that RNA scope probe diluent. Otherwise, you'll be mixing them with the C1 probe and 1 is to 50 dilution. RNA scope assay workflow. With the RNA scope assays, you may perform the assay as a one day assay though there are a couple of options to split this protocol into two days. The first option would be to complete the sample preparation and pretreatment on day one, and then begin with probe hybridization and detection the following day. Please do refer to the technical notes recommended for your sample type to determine where the stopping point may be feasible. If you're unsure, please do contact technical support. The second option for splitting into two-day assay would be to complete the sample preparation, pretreatment, and probe hybridization on the first day, then incubate the slides overnight in a 5X SSC, which is saline sodium citrate solution. The following day, you would remove the slides from 5X SSC and wash with a wash buffer, and then follow with the amplification reagent. This is particularly recommended with the duplex and multiplex fluorescent D2 assays, as these are much longer assays with several more amplification steps. A note on the site, in-house we use the 20X, per, 20x SSC purchased from uh, Fisher Scientific. This is a protocol overview of single plex chromogenic assay using FSPE samples. The single plex assay usually takes about eight hours, and please refer to the part one user manual for sample preparation and pretreatment recommendations. The assays are completed in four major steps, pretreatment, hybridization, amplification, and finally, staining and detection. The workflow for both FSPE and fixed frozen samples requires a heat-mediated target retrieval, followed by protease digestion for pretreatment. The workflow on the Leica Bond RX and Mantena systems are very similar to the manual assay. Similarly, fluorescent multi multiplex assay contains the four major parts, but it is a shorter assay. Again, please refer to the user manual for detailed recommendations. Here is a more detailed workflow for the multiplex fluorescent B2 assay. This is a TSA-based assay. Similar to the previous workflow diagram, pretreatment is completed first, followed by the target probe hybridization and subsequent amplification steps. This differs from the previously mentioned fluorescent assay as each channel is developed sequentially. The AMP 1, 2, and 3 steps are a pooled combination of the pre-amplifier and amplifier molecules so that the amplification trees begin to form simultaneously. This schematic shown here uses a fluorescein, Psi-3, and Psi-5 in the C1, C2, and C3 channels respectively. But these may be swapped as per your preference. Please note that this is a TSA-based assay, as I mentioned before, and requires the purchase of the TSA plus fluorophores or opal dyes from Perkin Elmer. This is a 
standard RNA scope kit configuration, which includes the necessary pretreatment reagent, the detection kit of choice, and the wash buffer. Not pictured here are the probes. Presented here are some recommended accessories required for running the manual RNA scope and base scope assays. To the top left are the two options for washing and handling slides. You may use either the Tissue Tech wash tray, common in most labs, or you can use our Easy Batch slide processing system, which was designed to streamline RNA scope and base scope assays and save handling time when working with a large number of samples. The HIBZ hybridization system to the right is designed to maintain the optimal temperature and humidity to ensure optimal and consistent RNA scope base scope staining. Below are two methods for carrying out the heat mediated target retrieval step required for some sample types such as FFP and fixed frozen samples. Our website has training videos on the different steps of the manual assay, which is a great visual guide to assist with running the RNA scope manual assay. Some general tips to ensure success with RNA scope and base scope assays. First, follow the protocol. We have various protocols that are complete with details to help address the best way to run the assay. Next. Sample pretreatment is very important to ensure that you get the most optimal RNA scope signal. The pretreatment conditions will differ from sample type to sample type and may require some optimization. Using controls is highly recommended, especially when you are troubleshooting your assay. And lastly, it is critical to make sure that you have all the components required to run the assay before you begin the assay. Here is an example of recommended sample preparation. With formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples, FSBE, we recommend fixing with 10% NBF for about 16 to 32 hours at room temperature. The recommended sample thickness is four to six microns. And we also recommend that the tissue is mounted onto super fast touch sites. In order to preserve RNA colony, it is recommended to store sections with desiccants at room temperature and can be stored for up to three months. For long-term storage, it is best to store at four degrees with desiccants. For fresh frozen samples, please review the user manual for detailed recommendations. A few highlights are presented here. We recommend storing frozen tissue blocks or sections airtight at minus 80 and can be stored up to three months. The recommended sample thickness is 10 to 20 microns, again mounted on super frost plus sites. Besides preparing samples according to our recommended protocol, it is very important to have proper controls for our scope assay. First, if you're running RNA scope assay for the very first time, we recommend running positive and negative control probes on our control slides, such as HeLa pellets, in order to ensure that the assay setup in the lab is optimal. Then proceed running the assay using our control probes on your sample to, add, to assess the sample RNA quality and to determine the best pretreatment conditions based on what you see in the, with the signal and the tissue morphology. And if your sample passes QC, you can then move on to running your target probe. Otherwise, it is recommended to verify your technique, check RNA quality, or perform assay optimization. I'll be discussing our scoring guidelines in a later slide. On this checklist are some other key components that can help ensure your success with RNA scope assay. For example, using the super fast plus slides, using appropriate mounting media, using fresh reagents, and using the hot plate or the steamer for the pretreatment. We 
also have some recommended general guidelines. For example, once you begin the assay, do not let the slides dry out. Do not alter the protocol. Warm the probes and the wash buffer before using at 40 degrees. When running the RNA scope or base scope assays, here are a few factors that could affect the outcome of your results. For example, fixation conditions are not optimal or hybridization conditions are not optimal. These factors and issues can be addressed by the following solutions. For example, please fix the, sam please fix the samples as recommended. Use the HIBZ hybridization system for optimal hybridization conditions. In the next few slides, I'll be discussing some of the key guidelines pertaining to each of the manual assays. Chromogenic brown assay is one of the most robust assays. It is an ideal assay for tissues that have AP-dependent backgrounds, such as kidney. But this assay is not ideal when using tissues that are subject to pigmentation, such as lung or skin samples. We recommend using any xylene-based mounting media for a brown assay. The fast red chromogen is used in both the RNA scope red and base scope assay. We recommend using either ecomount or vector mount media to help best preserve the staining. The chromogen is sensitive to alcohol and if exposed may cause signal diffusion. After chromogen development, the slide should not go through ethanol dehydration, but instead we recommend drying the slide in a drying oven at 60 degrees. Both of the red and green chromogens are sensitive to alcohol, so they should not be dehydrated using alcohol prior to mounting. Additionally, the green chromogen can be sensitive to extended exposure to water which can also diffuse the signal or even cause it to fade completely. Note that for the duplex assay, your C1 probe will be visualized in green and your C2 probe will be visualized in red. Additionally, we would recommend you consider splitting the assay into two days due to the length of time. For the fluorescent V1 assay, you can use different M4 alternatives, for example, A, B, or C, for the different 404 combinations, as you can see in the table above. We recommend using prolonged gold anti-fade mounting media to preserve fluorescence. The multiplex fluorescent B2 assay is a TSA-based assay. The TSA 404s have to be purchased from Perkin Elmer. Again, we recommend using prolonged gold and hefe as the mounting medium. And this assay can be again split into two days. After probe hydrolyzation, you can leave the slides in 5x SSC overnight at room temperature. Which fluorescent assay would be right for you? The first assay fluorescent multiplex V1 is best used with fresh frozen samples and consists of labeled probes conjugated to 404. This assay allows for triplexing capability of both up to three mRNA markers simultaneously in your tissue or cells. The second assay, multiplex fluorescent V2, is a TSA-based assay where it utilizes Perkin Elmer TSA 404 or opal dyes. It was developed with FFPE tissue tissues in mind to help address the autofluorescence issue. This assay can also be followed with immunofluorescence. We have a technical note up on the support page for the dual IF protocol, and I'll be discussing the dual IF protocol in detail in the later slides. With the additional purchase of a fourplex ancillary kit, the assay will allow for up to four plexing to detect up to four mRNA markers simultaneously. The LS multiplex assay is similar to the V2 assay, which, allows, which use, also utilizes the TSA plus or opal dyes. 
but it's completely automated on the Leica Bond RX. In the next few slides, I'll help understanding the RNA scope assays results. Some of the questions you may have at this point include, what does a dot mean? What is the significance of dot size? What is the difference between a dot and a cluster? And what is the sensitivity of RNA scope versus ISC? In this image, an RNA scope chromogenic assay has been performed with a red chromogen. Signal appears as numerous punctate red dots of various sizes and intensities in few clusters. It is the number of dots and or the clusters that are important, rather than the size of the dot or the intensity of the dot. Each punctate dot means one RNA molecule. The small, faint punctate dot pointed by the blue arrow is one mRNA molecule. The slightly larger, darker red, nicely round punctate dot pointed by the yellow or arrow is also one mRNA molecule. However, its larger size is due to the more ZZ probes bound to the target molecule. In contrast, a cluster pointed by the brown arrow is more oblong with a slightly irregular border and results from overlapping signals from multiple mRNA molecules. Similar patterns of dots and clusters are seen in fluorescent versions of the assay. The yellow arrow points to a single mRNA molecule with less or fewer ZZ probe pairs bound to them compared with the dot pointed by the teal arrow. The white arrow, on the other hand, is pointing to a cluster with an irregular rather than round shape resulting from overlapping signals from multiple mRNA molecules. RNA scope staining can be quantified by manually counting the number of dots per cell. It is also known as the semi-quantitative scoring method. With this method, a score of zero to four is assigned based on the average number of dots per cell. For more quantitative approaches to data analysis of the RNA scope results, visit the links below where you can download a free guide describing the different methodologies available to quantify your results. If you have further questions, please contact technical support. As mentioned before, it is critical to qualify your sample using control probes before running the assay using the target probe. Now you may ask, why optimize your assay? Here are some potential reasons why you may need to optimize your assay. If the samples are underfixed, this can usually lead to over-digestion of your samples using the standard condition. And if the samples are overfixed, the signal could be weak and you may need to optimize. There are also some particular sample types that could require different pretreatment conditions and optimization with a few listed here. If your tissue of interest is not listed, or you are unsure if your tissue has been fixed as per our recommendations, please please to reach, to reach out to technical support. When running the RNA scope assay on your samples, begin with standard conditions of 15 minutes of target retrieval at 100 degrees Celsius and 30 minutes of protease treatment at 40, and that's for FFP tissues. Observe for signal intensity and background with control probes and sample morphology. It is always best to start with standard conditions as per the appropriate techno or user manual for your sample type when qualifying your samples if we do not have a recommendation available. And this will help to set a baseline for how the assay performs and based on your results, we can make recommendations to either scale the pretreatment up or down. Both the target retrieval and protease digestion perform on a sliding scale, such that you may adjust it depending on what your samples look like or what the fixation conditions are.
Optimizing on the automated platforms is also similar in that you would change your epitope retrieval time and temperature as well as time, time spent with protease. Provided that the target is expressed in the sample and the protocol is followed as recommended, the RNA-scope assay is pretty much guaranteed. Because tissue samples can be highly variable, proper sample preparation and the right controls are, are essential to an RNA-scope experiment. Tissue samples must be properly fixed and prepared to ensure good RNA quality and no background due to poor fixation. ACD provides guidelines on how tissues should be fixed for optimal performance of the RNA scope assay. Here are serial sections from a human lung cancer sample on which we perform the manual red chromogenic assay. On the left is the section stained with our negative control probe, DAP-B, which is a bacterial gene that is not expressed in most tissues. As observed in the sample, there should be no signal from DAP-B. The panel in the center shows a section from the same sample stained with our positive control probe for the housekeeping gene PPIB. As observed in the sample, you see fairly uniform detection with the positive control probe indicating that the RNA quality is good. Certain tissues may express the positive control at a higher or lower level, but in general, you want to see expression throughout the sample. With the results from these two probes, we can have confidence in the test data we see in the right panel. As an example, I'm showing a section from the same lung cancer sample probe for the immuno checkpoint marker program that ligand one or PDL1. PDL1 exhibits a wide range of expression in tumor tissue. In this human lung cancer sample, we observe strong punctate dots with the PDL1 probe indicating expression of PDL1 in this tumor sample. The controls show us that the RNA quality is good throughout the tissue sample and that there is little to no background, and hence we can be confident that the localized pattern of expression we observe for PDL1 is in fact the expected pattern. Now let's review some troubleshooting examples and the results after performing optimization on these samples. This shows optimal digestion optimal digestion with the tissue fixed with our recommendations and then treating with the standard conditions. PPIB staining is strong, while the DAP-B negative control is clean. Tissue morphology is intact and hematoxylin staining is homogenous. Note that this assay was run on the Lycabon RX, so the pretreatment conditions shown are with regards to running this on the automated platform. These are the standard conditions on bond RX. As compared to the last slide, this data set shows tissue that has been over-digested, in which the nuclei are now undefined due to the suboptimal tissue morphology, and the PPIB staining is slightly weaker than expected. Again, please note these conditions were done on the Lycabon arc. Now let's review some troubleshooting examples and the results here. Here, the target retrieval time was reduced to eight minutes, and that improved the morphology and eliminated the background seen in the negative control, as seen on the right. As compared to the image on the left, there is better morphology and better signal resolution on using the modified target retrieval time. And please note, this is the positive control probe, PPIB. Now moving to the opposite direction. Here are samples that have been under-digested. The PPIB staining is much weaker, but the tissue morphology looks great, showing no signs of over-digestion. And this is the negative control on the right and the positive on the left. Now when we modify the target retrieval time, here the target retrieval time was increased to 30 minutes and that improved the signal intensity and resolution and eliminated trapping of the chromogen as you would see on the left with the 15 minute target retrieval time.
Shown here to the right is an image of RNA scope performed on a sample that was fixed too long, three weeks of fixation. And as you can see, the signal is very weak. And hence, we highly recommend fixing the samples as per our recommendations. When the multiplex porous and RNA scope assays are successful, you should see images like the ones shown here. This is using M4ALT-A option and was performed on the HeLa control cell pellet with the human 3 plex positive control probes, which include Polar 2A, PPIB, and UVC. Majority of our customers use fresh frozen samples. The images here display how proteus pretreatment can affect RNA scope signal quality. With the mouse kidney sample, you can see there is quite a bit of tissue autofluorescence. But when the sample is appropriately digested using proteus 4 at room temperature for 30 minutes, distinct green and red dots can be observed with control probes. When proteus digestion is performed at 40 degrees Celsius, the tissue is over-digested, as you can see on the top left. And not only do you not see any punctate signal, you see an increase in background. Again, with adequately treated fresh frozen mouse brain samples, there is no background and you can observe beautiful punctate signals. And with tissue over-digestion on the left, you can see an increase in background and decrease in signal. One known issue with the fluorescent assay is that due to the long fixation time, SFP samples are prone to inherent autofluorescence which poses challenges for image analysis. You can use FFPE if you have background correction software to reduce autofluorescence, and alternatively, we now have developed a multiplex fluorescent V2 assay that helps to address this issue. If you are still experiencing autofluorescence issues with your assay, please do contact technical support. We highly recommend superfrost first slides to ensure optimal sample adherence. If you observe tissue detachment, that likely causes are listed here. We have found that adding an additional baking step can mitigate this issue. I will review the additional baking steps incorporated for FSP and fixed frozen samples. These apply to all assay types. If you're observing detachment after the hydrogen peroxide or target retrieval, then add a baking step before hydrogen peroxide treatment. Or if you're observing tissue coming off from the slides after proteus treatment, add an additional baking step before that. Both baking steps are for 30 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius in a circulating dry oven. For sample detachment with fixed frozen tissues, we recommend to dry slides at minus 20 for two hours after cryosectioning and adding a post-fixation step before hydrogen peroxide and target retrieval for 15 minutes to up to two hours at room temperature. We have found that majority of the sample detachment happens after target retrieval. So we recommend adding an additional baking step before the proteus step. After trying the above step from one to three, if you're still observing detachment, we recommend to omit the target retrieval and extend the proteus time to up to 45 minutes. Also, please contact support and we can help you figure out the best troubleshooting path for this tissue. For probe-related troubleshooting, if you're working with the two scenarios listed here, please contact technical support. With knockout with not validations, as we have thousands of probes currently in inventory, we would like to help ensure the probe you're picking is specific for your wild type versus knockout validation. If you're working with novel gene and no catalog probe is available, please feel free to contact your area account manager or go to our website to get your custom probe design feasibility test started. We have recommended sample preparation protocols for the most commonly used sample types. But if you're working with unique sample types, such as whole mount, free floating tissue, bone, please feel free to contact tech support for suggestions and guidance. 
Now I'm going to jump to the applications of the RNA scope assay. So eventually here are some of the key areas where RNA scope has been increasingly used. In the next few slides, I'll go over some examples of these applications. For many targets, reliable antibodies for ISV detection are not available. An example of this is LGR5, which is an intestinal stem cell marker. In this study, the authors used RNA scope to detect LGR5 in human colorectal cancer samples. LGR5 is known to be a stem cell marker in the murine small intestine and colon. However, the localization of LGR5 in human adenoma samples has not been examined in detail, and previous studies have been limited by the lack of specific antibodies. The authors approached very systematically to see the localization of LGR5 expressing cells and to understand differences or alterations in stem cell architecture in human normal colon, adenomas of different histological subtypes, and adenocarcinoma of all stages. For many GPCRs, there are either no antibodies available or no reliable antibodies available. So detection of GPCRs in the tissue context can be limiting. Dopamine receptors are implicated in many neurological processes, including motivation, cognition, memory, et cetera. Here we demonstrate the de detection of the two distinct neuronal populations marked by the GPCRs DDR DRD1 in red and DRD2 in green in the striatum using the RNA scope for us and multiplex assay. Here is an image of the V group 1, 2, and V GAT receptors in FSBE mouse brain using the multiplex fluorescent V2 assay. Here is a high magnification image of the same markers in the mouse brain. One of the most asked questions is can you combine RNA scope ish with ISC or IF? And the answer is yes. Both procedures do have a similar workflow as shown here. Both require sample fixation, some kind of pretreatment to unmask your RNA or protein, and subsequent detection. The, re the recommended workflow is as following. You would pretreat and permeabilize your tissue itself first. Depending on the tissue, this may require both a heat-mediated target retrieval as well as a protease digestion. You would then complete the RNA scope fish portion and then follow with IFC staining after. We do have some recommendations to ensure success with your dual ish IFC assay. First, all dual ish IFC protocols require optimization. In general, it is recommended to combine a working RNA scope protocol with a working IFC protocol. In addition, work with antibodies and a protocol that are known and already established with your tissue samples. Second, it is advisable to perform ISH first followed by ISC. Third, it is advisable to optimize the ISC assay separately using the RNA scope pretreatment reagents to ensure your protein can still be detected following RNA scope pretreatment. RNA scope requires the protease digestion to unmask the RNA. So do keep in mind as you optimize the ISC. Lastly, the dual ish ISC assay works better for highly expressed proteins due to the protease treatment that is used during the ish protocol. Here is one example of using RNA scope single prex brown assay to detect the OLF4 probe with subsequent ISC staining in red for light design. Here is an example of a dual RNA scope, dual HISC with two markers followed by immunofluorescence staining. The IDA1 and PDL1 RNA scope markers are shown in green and red, while the CD8 antibody is shown in white for sci fi. Using, and this is using multiplex fluorescent V2 assay, which is the TSA based assay. Another area of RNA scope application is validation of RNA seq results. The authors used RNA scope ish to confirm the identity of the neuronal subtypes identified using single nucleus RNA seq. 
They, per they performed RNA scope on a set of selected markers that complemented their RNA-seq study and confirmed the subtype and layer-specific expression of the markers in the cortex. This paper demonstrate, demonstrates a robust and scalable method for identifying and categorizing single nuclear transcriptomes. Now we are switching gears to discuss about the base scope assay. Base scope is the next generation in situ hybridization. It is based on the RNA scope technology, but there are several major differences as listed here. First, a standard RNA scope probe contains 20 ZZ pairs, which targets a 1 KB region of the target sequence, whereas base scope can detect signal with as low as 1 ZZ pair probe. Both RNA scope and base scope is capable of signal, single molecule detection meaning that a single dot represents one single RNA molecule or target. RNA scope is a robust assay to detect gene expression of most RNA targets, whereas base scope is specifically designed for the detection of exon junctions, short target sequences, which I will describe in further details later in the presentation. RNA scope is capable to detect up to three targets simultaneously, whereas currently base scope is a single plex. Detection with RNA scope can be chromogenic or fluorescent, whereas currently base scope is only available with fast red detection, which can be visualized by chromogenic or fluorescent detection. RNA scope can be performed manually or by automation, whereas currently base scope is a manual assay only. The base scope probes are designed differently, so they cannot be combined with RNA scope reagents, and vice versa. RNA scope probes cannot be combined with base scope reagents. While RNA scope is a robust assay to detect gene expression of most mRNA targets, base scope is specifically used for detection of exon junctions and short target sequences, as mentioned before. Here is an assay workflow for base scope, which is very similar to RNA scope assay workflow. Based on our experience, base scope assay may require a strong pretreatment due to the additional amplification step required. As a note, do not mix RNA scope and base scope reagents as they are not compatible with each other. Applications of the base scope assay. Listed here are a few of the key areas of the base scope application. Due to the limited time, I will present just one example. Please refer to our previous webinars for details on base scope assay applications. One of the applications of the base scope assay is detection of short sequences. For example, the CDR3 alpha and CDR3 beta sequences from the JERCAT T cell line differ from each other by only approximately 50 nucleotides, as shown in the blue. Base scope probes were designed to target either CDR3 alpha or beta, and the sense probe was used as a negative control. The images are shown below. And lastly, I will quickly move to the uh, frequently asked questions. Do I need to run every single AMP reagent when doing the multiplex fluorescent assay? The answer is yes. Each AMP serves as a building block for the amplification structure of your target mRNA. And if the AMPs are missed, this may result in no signal. We have discussed this before, but I want to stress the nomenclature of C1, C2, and C3 probes. In order to detect multiple mRNAs, we have a tail sequence that is indicated of a channel designator. So a C1 probe will have a C1 tail sequence, which is unique from the C2 probe and C3 probe, and that way the pre-amplifiers, amplifiers, and label probes specific to each channel are built on top of it. I'll show an image on the next slide. So this image shows the distinct yet separate amplification trees for each channel in the fluorescent multiplex assay, which allows for simultaneous detection of multiple markers. Are RNA scope assays compatible with different tissues and sample types? Yes. So RNA scope assays can be used with FFP, fresh frozen, fake frozen, and even culture itself. They were all primarily uh, 
automated for FFP tissue, but now with the Lycabon RX, they're compatible with fixed frozen and fresh frozen samples as well. Why did I not see signal with my positive control PPID? There may be several reasons why you didn't see a signal with the positive control. Some of them are listed here, which include compromised RNA quality. If the RNA is degraded, it will be hard to see the signal. If the sample preparation and pretreatment is not optimized for the sample, so the sample preparation and sample pretreatment will have to be optimized to get a good positive control signal. How flexible is it to switch fluorescent dyes between channels in the LS multiplex fluorescent assay or the manual V2 assay? The V2 assay gives you the flexibility to choose your fluorophore um, for different probes that you're interested in, meaning the fluorescent dyes can now be switched by changing the sequence for adding the fluorophores. Can I combine the RNA scope and base scope assays? The answer is no. The assays cannot be combined as the chemistry between these two assays is completely different, which also means you cannot combine um, the probes that are for RNA scope with the base scope and vice versa. For additional information, please visit our website at acdbio.com. If you click on the support tab, which is second from right, multiple pages have a wealth of information, including troubleshooting guides, user manuals, tech notes, training videos for the manual assay, as well as previously recorded webinars that cover a wide range of different topics and applications. With that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. My colleagues are still on the line to help address your questions, so please feel free to continue sending your questions too. Again, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and available on the website as previously shown, and it will be available soon. In the event you were unable to get a question sent through the chat or Q&A feature, I'm leaving up the contact information for technical support here. You may send in an email to support at acdbio.com. You can also call in our technical support phone line at 877-576-3636 and go for option three. Please do note the hours of the phone line are from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. PST, which is Pacific Standard Time in the U.S. Thank you so 